our guest this evening. Armin Navabi is an atheist activist known for his extensive efforts in promoting secularism, atheism, liberalism among different communities worldwide. As a former practicing Shia Muslim turned outspoken atheist, his experiences lend authenticity to his work. Navabi founded Atheist Republic, a nonprofit organization that has grown to provide a safe space for non-believers worldwide to connect, share ideas, and offer mutual support. His influential book, Why There Is No God, deconstructs common arguments for the existence of God and has established him as a thought leader within atheist circles. He frequently speaks at conferences and events worldwide, spreading his message of liberal and secular values. Armin is also the host of the Atheist Republic YouTube channel, where Armin and Susanna discuss relevant events from all around the world to attract and connect atheists across borders and promote a global secular movement. So Armin, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. How are you? What have you been up to lately? Tell us about yourself. Good. Thank you so much for having me. This is such an honor. I can't believe I'm here. I was, uh, this is an organization that I always uh, supported and advertised and promoted to anybody that was asking about uh, any kind of support on our shows. And to, to be here is just such an honor. I don't know how to describe how proud I am to be to be here with you guys. Like you, I'm so glad thank you're you. here. Thank you so much for yeah thank you for inviting me I don't, uh, absolutely I don't know honey to... i love i love it your work and you're amazing so i'm so glad that you're here yes we're glad you're here so this worked out well for everyone yes we're all we're all very <laughs> proud of ourselves right now <laughs> i love it i love it yeah and you know i'm also really excited to have you here because i love that kind of your your message here is having these communications that go across borders, connecting people from all around the world. And I think that is so important. And I was just talking with Helen the other day about how, you know, being that our program um, is we're based in the US. Uh, we are also a worldwide organization. Like we were mentioning earlier, we have support groups in several different countries, but a lot of our programming does tend to um, be more populated by, I guess, uh, former Christians. And we talk about that a lot on here, but that's not the only group of people that need to recover from religion. That's not the only group of people out there. So I'm really glad that you were able to join us this evening to kind of help us broaden our perspective a little bit and give us some more information about what else is going on in the world. <laughs> and uh, I was hoping that you might be able to tell us a little bit about your background and some of the beliefs that you grew up with and how you later came to not believe in those things so much anymore yeah before i get there i just want to emphasize uh, what you just said because it's not just um there's a myth that americans are american focused america focused more than other people around the world but other people are also very focused on their own countries as well so like what we try to do our, our audience atheist republics community and audience is very global like um that's something that we're proud of like um it's very diverse india israel iran uh, indonesia malaysia we have uh, it's very diverse and what we try to do is to try to get them a feel a sense of being in a team that is across borders because the thing that i'm trying to convince our audience and our community is that the threat of um, religious dogma and superstitious belief and conservatism um, and illiberalism is, uh, is something to take very seriously. I, I don't think a lot of people appreciate how big of a threat and this is to our future and the cost that we're paying today for these for these ideas. Um, I, I mean, if you go, if you look at what's happening in India. If you go and look at what's happening in Nigeria, the main the, the main cost that the, the main barrier to progress in India is religion. In Nigeria, one of the main, let me be more careful about how I word things. In Nigeria, in, in Israel, in the United States, in Iran. Um and and I think the threat is such a and the conservative mindset and the religious uh dogma, the that mindset and that ideology it's it's global like they are that's a they are united across borders and it's such and we can't deal with the, such a big threat one country at a time it's a global threat and it needs to be dealt with 
globally. We need to find each other and work with each other. And the, 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 our show on, on Atheist Republic YouTube channel and all the other stuff that we do is just an attempt to try to get that feeling that we're all in this together and we all need to be working with each other. So that's one of the things that we're trying to get to advertise, to promote that, that idea. So going, yeah, go on. Oh, no, I was just saying, yeah, I, I think that is a really great perspective. I'm, you're right. This is not the kind of thing that, you know, we, we don't want to play whack-a-mole. <laughs> this is this is a bigger issue. <laughs> a lot of times things are more interconnected than <laughs> we might realize. So, that, yeah, I, I appreciate your taking that perspective and taking that on. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and we see that, by the way, just one last point before I actually answer your question. We see that, that connection. Like when we see, for example, in Russia when we see some far right ideas growing, we see how they're taking their, their, their messaging from the United States or people some in, in Uganda getting some messages from the UK or like vice versa. Like we see, they, it's, it, it's not isolated. These people are very much in touch with each other and it doesn't make sense for us not to be in touch with each other if we're trying to confront that. Um, so that being said, I do. Uh, so your, your question about my personal journey. Um, so I grew up in, in Iran. Um, I grew up in a very liberal family, extremely liberal, but in a very conservative society. So there was like a mismatch between my, the views at home and the views at school. And, you know, uh, it was so I had to from the very beginning, I could tell that, you know, I have to pick which one of these things are right. Um, but I remember I I choose wrongly. I choose the religious side. I became extremely religious. But before I get before I got there, um, the journey, I don't know, I don't know how much detail you want to get in and get into, but I'll try to be quick, right? So you, we've got you for an hour, so talk as much okay, as you want. So <laughs> okay, okay. So I don't like talking about myself so much because I've gone through this story like a, a a billion times. So but I'll but but I know every time I say it, I have to say it as if I'm saying it for the first time. Um, I heard, Helen has already heard the story, so I don't know if she wants to hear it again. But yeah, I'm, so you when have I have a new audience, man. So I've heard the story, yeah. <laughs> but this is a new audience. So you know, like entertain right. them. I'm just here for. I'm just here to sit here and look pretty. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're doing a good job. Um, so okay, so when I was a child, I was introduced to the concept of hell. And it didn't make sense to me. Um, it didn't make sense to me because it just was too brutal. And I couldn't understand why people, other people around me were not concerned about that. Because I thought from even before elementary school, like when I was six years old, I was so baffled by the idea that people around me are not prioritizing avoiding hell. Because I thought there there's this belief that there's this place that we will end up with we could end up in and we would be burning be burned alive for thousands and thousands of years and that is a possibility that's a possibility of my future and these people around me believe that as well and they don't seem that concerned about it i could not understand how could they not be concerned about it one thing i did is that i actually uh, lit up a match and I put it on my arm just to see how much it would hurt to get burnt. And I I could, I tried to, it was very painful. And I tried to imagine that all over my body. So I felt how it feels to be burned. And I tried to imagine that all over my body. And then I tried to imagine experiencing that sensation for five minutes straight. And then for 10 minutes straight. And then for a year, then for 10 years, then for 10,000 years. And I'm like, there's no way anyone could tolerate that. Like, I could, I couldn't just, I couldn't tolerate half a second of that on, on, on just my arm. Um, and so I was, uh, and here's the thing: I, I started. I remember actually one time crying about this as a child before I even started going to school. And I remember my aunt noticing that I was crying because I was trying to hide it and all. And she asked me, 
she, fe- she, f- she figured out that I was crying about going to hell. And she told me, oh, don't worry. Only like the worst of worst people will go to hell, like the murderers and the rapists. You, you know, most people are not going to go to hell. Uh, so that calmed me. But then I went to school and I was told that that's actually not the case. Most people, including Muslims, will go to hell. So non-Muslims will go to hell and they will stay in hell forever. But Muslims will go to hell for just like a couple of thousands of years, um, maybe a hundred thousand years or something to, to pay for their sins. And then once they pay for their sins, they will go to heaven, right? Um, so yeah, I, like most Muslims will also go to hell because they sin, you know, only a few people. Oh, uh, here's the thing. Only certain, there are certain people who don't sin, which are pure people. So that is Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad. That is the 12 Imams. And that is Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad, right? So that's 14 people and also the rest of the prophets, actually. So these are people who have not sinned and they are pure, okay? But there's another group of people that are pure, that will that have no sin, that do not have to pay for it in hell. That's children. So other, unlike Christianity, which, when you are, which you are born with sin, so here's a, something that Muslims make, and some Muslims make fun of Christianity. They think like Christianity makes no sense. It makes no sense because how could how could a baby be sinful? Like they say, like their religion makes no sense. In Islam, you understand that a child is pure. A child is without sin, and you could only be responsible for your actions what you once you hit, hit the age of reason. Reason. Um, and for for so what is the age of reason? And different sects in Islam t- tell you differently. But what I learned when I was uh, in school is that the age of reason for boys is fifteen. And for girls, it's nine. Um, I they, they used to tell us that oh, look how pro pro female Islam is because it's telling you that not women mature faster than boys, so this is pro woman. And later, I realized that that actually has something more to do with the age of marriage. It's more, it was more about the age of marriage rather than how fast uh, uh, girls mature. Um, so what? So I put two and two together. I realized that okay. So if you can't sin before the age of reason, that means that if I die before the age of reason, I will go to heaven, right? So the, the way that they told us about this is that there are two angels on your shoulders. So it's, it's, uh, and one of them is taking notes of, uh, of your good deeds, like writing all them down. And the other one is writing all your sins. And at the day of judgment, they, these angels will open the books and they will like compare your sins compared uh, to your good deeds. Um, but these, these notebooks that these angels have are white clean until you hit the age of reasons. They're not taking any notes until you hit the age of, that you can be responsible for your actions, right? So if you die before the age of reason, you go in the afterlife, you have not sinned. So where do you go? I, I where, where do people who have never sinned go? They will go to heaven. So there's another thing that they told us is they told us that suicide is a sin in Islam, right? If you commit suicide, you will automatically go to hell. However, you can't sin before age 15. So what if I commit suicide before age 15? Because yes, suicide is a sin, but there's no sin before age 15. So I like, if I kill myself before age 15, I could go directly to heaven. I would avoid the chance of going to hell. And I was like, why would I not just kill myself? I couldn't understand why other people have not tried this. Why would other people gamble the potential of going to hell? So I wanted to, I wanted to kill myself, but just to make sure that I don't go to hell, but I had to double check with my religion teacher at school to make sure that I got everything right, because I wanted to make sure that I don't get this wrong. This is like my, my, my eternal life we're talking about here, right? So I go and talk to my religion teacher and I ask him, why wouldn't I just kill myself before I hit age 15? So I make sure that I don't go, I don't go to hell. He told me that the reason why you wouldn't do that is because when children go to heaven, they go to the lowest part of heaven. So if heaven apparently has seven layers. The best part is where martyrs go. That's where Muhammad is as well. And 
this is like the apparently the most boring part of heaven that is less special than the parts of heaven, the other parts of heaven. So like, yeah, that's where you go. But if you become an adult and earn going to heaven, you go to a better part of heaven. So why would you not want that? And I, as a child, I thought this man is an idiot. I don't care which part of heaven I go to. I just don't want to go to hell. I'll take a parking lot for eternity as long as I can guarantee not being burned for thousands of years. Like, look at the greed here. Like, you're, you're, like, why would I gamble? Like, just because you're like, oh, I could get a chance of better. Like, you're going to risk burning for thousands of years in heaven, hell just because you are greedy for a higher part of heaven. I, I, I'm not going to take that risk. I'm not going to take that risk. So I jumped out of the out of my the window of my school. Um, I broke both my legs. I broke my left arm. I fractured my back. I almost cut my spine because the bone in my back was fractured, but it didn't. I didn't cut my spine. I was in a wheelchair um, and my bed for seven months. I lost one year of school, and the only reason why I didn't try it again was because I saw what it did to my parents. It's, it destroyed them. It like, it devastated them. Um, I don't know if my mom ever recovered from that. But I saw what I was, what that did to them. So that's why I never tried it again. Um, so I hit age 15 and I was like, I'm stuck now. There's nothing I could do now. I'm stuck in this game. And I was so upset. Like, why? Like nobody asked for my consent to play this game. Like this is a game that I'm that I've been thrown into, and the consequences of losing is so high. What if what if I didn't? What if like if if anybody was told that would you want to play this game? The obvious answer would be like just don't create me. Just don't create me. I don't want this. I don't want to play this game. Um, and I actually asked my religion teacher like why. Why was I even created? I didn't want to play this game. And they, they, they have a trick. They have they, they, these religious people. They have answers for everything. They have thought about this for thousands, for like more than 1400 years. So they told me that you were asked and you said yes, but you don't remember. <laughs> so apparently we all have been, we all have consented. Um, so that's the, the, that's the way they play around that. So I hit age 15. I'm like, it's okay. I got this. How hard could it be? How hard could this be? Um, you pray. You fast. You don't sin. If you sin, you ask for forgiveness. And then you don't try to mess with anybody. And you got this. You could do this. It's not that hard. It's not that hard. Just pray, fast, be a good person, and you're going to be good. But here's the problem. I'm a, I was a teenager, okay? And here's the problem with being around age 15 is you start noticing certain things more and more. Especially, okay, so as a, and as a straight boy, you start noticing girls a lot. And here's, here's the thing. Allah is not just a tyrant of your actions. He's also a, a tyrant in your mind. So your thoughts are sins. It's not just your actions that are sins. It's your thoughts that are sins. And you have this belief that every disgusting, filthy, degenerate thought that is coming through your mind is being observed constantly. And you feel shame. You feel a lot of shame, okay? For this God that has created you, that has given you everything. And imagine thinking that he can see the the disgusting thought that I just had, and he's a, he's he's the creator of the universe is disgusted by you and how and look at you, look how pathetic you are, look how every, everything that this God has done for you, and you can't even control your nasty thoughts, right? So I don't know I don't know if I could describe how hard it is to deal with that as a teenage boy, and I now many years later now that I think about it. I, I can't imagine how much more difficult that is for somebody who's like gay, because one thing that as a teenage boy, you a straight boy, you keep telling yourself is like, one day I will get married, one day I will get married and it will be fine. And we could do, you know, 
whatever. And it's good. And we will, I will have an outlet to basically, but if I was gay, I would be like, this is, this is ever, this is forever. This, this thought that God is watching my disgusting thoughts is forever. And I have no way out. Right. So that was difficult. Um, but also another thing that was very difficult was the thoughts of my parents burning in hell because my parents didn't pray. My parents didn't fast. My parents, the only time they went into a mosque was when somebody was getting married or when someone died. Okay, so, and my 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 parents, uh, my mom drank wine, my dad drinks beer, and, and these people are going to go to hell. And I couldn't even understand how could I enjoy heaven knowing that my parents are being burned and, and screaming in pain. So I couldn't understand that. And also, like, you know, in my in 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 the environment I grew up, I in, in our household, we watched Hollywood movies. The news that we watched was like BBC. Um, so and the the actual religion, like the second religion in Iran was soccer. So I was constantly seeing, you know, Hollywood act actors and actresses and you know journalists on BBC and soccer players from all around the world. And every time I saw those watching those on, on TV, I was like, these people are going to burn forever. And I was like, how's that fair? Like, even though I was a Muslim and I was being a practicing, observing Muslim, I couldn't understand. Like my dad was watching the news on BBC and I was looking at the guy like, this part, like I can't like imagining the guy, he's not a Muslim. So he's going to burn over forever. Like, why is somebody not worried about this man? He's going to burn. Like does, his, does his children know that he's going to burn forever. Like, like all of these very famous Hollywood actors and actors, none of them are Muslim. I'm like, okay, this doesn't make any sense. I couldn't understand how a kind God would just burn all these people for such a long time. So I was like, I need to, I need to investigate this because this makes no sense. I thought to myself that the idea that you need to be Muslim to go to heaven, maybe we have to be a little bit more loose about how we define what a Muslim is. I was like, maybe these people are Muslim-ish if we stretch the definition of what a Muslim is, right? So I tried to understand what other people believe in. To do that, I went and try to start studying other religions. Um, and I remember going into the library and I found a book that with the title, The History of Religion, right? And apparently it was a translation of a Russian book into Persian. And I started reading a book and it was quite different from what I anticipated. It started with cavemen and their practices and um, how they... The, set, the, set, the rituals they had with their burial, and those were the first signs of people having um, belief in afterlife. Because I, my, my understanding was that, you know, religion started with Adam, and people believed in Allah from the very beginning. But this was like, this book was telling me that there was no signs of people having any religion until these. And this was, this was very different from the monotheistic belief that I had, pe that people started with. And then it kept on evolving um, from one society, from, from one civilization to another. And by the time I hit ancient Egypt, I was like, this is all made up. This is all made up. And I couldn't believe that I had not figured it out by now. I'm like, this is all made up and nobody, this is a lie. And nobody is telling us this. I mean, the, the book wasn't trying to tell you that religion is nonsense but i based on studying the history of religion i was like yeah this is obviously a man-made concept um but then i thought that i'm going crazy because i thought i don't know anybody that thinks this like i thought i'm being so i mean i must be losing my mind because imagine the arrogance of thinking that i figured out like this is like a conspiracy theory right Imagine thinking that everybody, everybody around you believes in this lie, that, that I'm claiming that God and afterlife is all made up. And I, and, you know, university professors that I know, doctors I know, my teachers at school, they all believe this. And you, you, Armin, you have figured it out. You have outsmarted all of these people. Sure, sure. 
the more likely explanation is that you're going insane, that they know something and you are just delusional. So I was like, I need to figure out if other people think like this because I don't know anybody else that thinks like this. So I started an online community on Orkut back then before this is pre-Facebook days, right? And to find other people from around the world to, to that maybe think the same way. And that was the beginning of Atheist Republic because I wanted to see if there are more people like me. And that was then. And now Atheist Republic has become a community of more than 2 million people from around the world. Um, and I always try to remember the real reason why I started it, because I know we do a lot of activism. We do a lot of, you know, debates about religion, um, critical thinking, analyzing superstitious beliefs. Um, but I always wanted to, whenever I say the story, I want to remind myself that the main reason why I made that community was because I was alone and I didn't know anybody that was an atheist and I needed to reach out to somebody like me, right? And to this day, that is the main purpose to find other people, to, to have a place for other people to know that not only there are more people like them that are atheists, but there is support for them and there's a community for them. And that's what you guys do as well. Um, and, and back then there was no such thing. Back then it was much more difficult. I don't know how to describe the shock because I, because when I started that community, it grew really fast from the very beginning. And I was like, I didn't know there are so many of you out there. But the interesting thing is that they were saying the same thing. Every time, every day, every day from the beginning, it been, I couldn't remember. Like I was so active on this because I was obsessed with this. But there wasn't a single day that somebody didn't come in that group and says, what the hell? I didn't know there were so many other people like me. So that's the background. I sorry I went for a little bit too long, but no, you didn't. Yeah, no, we wanted to. You hear. added more detail into the story than the one you told me, Armin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that is a really yeah. powerful story. Thank you for sharing that. I, that is oh. deeply personal, and I'm seeing a lot of people in the chat really kind of strongly relating to oh. in some ways, and um, really appreciating. Uh, what you're doing uh, that is i mean you know the way you lay it out i i agree it's it's hard to imagine that you know these people telling children about hell it's it's almost like they're not thinking through how that sounds to a child like you're threatening someone with eternal torment uh, what like your uh, your your conclusion was not an illogical one <laughs> and <laughs> Yikes. Uh, I mean, that reminds me a lot of, you know, growing up in, in my family, we were, of course, you know, growing up uh, very fundamentalist evangelical Christian, but there was this big push to make sure that you're not watching any media that's not Christian. You're not reading any books that's not Christian. You're not having any friends that aren't Christian. You're not going to public school. It was a big push to make sure that you don't get out there and run across other people that don't believe this because then it'll all start to unravel. And I think that's so important because if, if you're kept in a, a circle of people where you're the only one that's questioning it, it does it. It's like gaslighting. It makes you feel like there's something wrong with me rather than recognizing, no, actually there's, there's not mm -hmm. other people are wondering about this too. And that's, Oh, wow. I mean, what an important thing that you're doing to provide that for other people who may be in places where there's limited access. Wow. So, okay. I have so many follow-up questions. I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> um, we, okay. Well, that's why you wrote Samakara. So I you did. have a place of beginning. Yes, I do. Because you're a smart person. 
I have to prompt myself so that I sound sometimes like a vaguely smart person. You're overeducated anyway. <laughs> that is that is true. Um, as some people would say, educated beyond their intelligence. <laughs> was that last week? I think that was last that week. That was last week. Yeah. But I, but I, appreci I appreciate your big brain, Kara. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, it's, you know, sometimes does a little bit most of the time. It's just it's just hanging out, trying to hang on to its last remaining cells. Oh, but no. Um, no. Are I do. <laughs> aren't we all? Yes. All right. Let's get back I, to the interview. Let's yes, do our I have so many follow up <laughs> questions. So, OK, when this happened and you decided, OK, I've got to start this so other people can also be in a community and find a space, you know, where there are others like them. How did this impact your relationship with your family, with your friends? If you feel comfortable talking about it, if you don't, it's totally OK. We can skip that part. But. Uh, OK, so. My okay, so just to be clear, my family is not a good representation of a lot of people's experiences in Iran because my family were very, very liberal. Um, but uh, so when I told my parents that I became an atheist the first time, they said, Oh, thank God, because before that, I was harassing them with my. With, my, with being very religious because I was trying to get them to pray. I was trying to get them to fast because I was trying to save them from hell. Uh, and it was just annoying to them. Uh, so at first they were relieved, but then they got worried. Because at first when I told them I'm an atheist, I was like, oh my God, we don't have a morality police in our house anymore. Uh, this is great. But, but then they realized that me being an atheist has its own problems. Because just like I couldn't shut up about being a Muslim when I was a Muslim, uh, I couldn't shut up about being an atheist when I became an atheist. And this is in Iran, where the punishment for leaving Islam is death. Um, so they were quite worried now about my safety because I couldn't shut my mouth. I was telling people, I was telling my friends, I was even telling my teachers. Um, so that got them very worried. Yeah. Okay, that was going to be my next follow up question. You preempted it um, because, <laughs> um, yeah, an understanding in, in Iran, it can be, um, it's a little bit more dangerous. I know a lot of times when we have uh, clients who call in uh, from places like Iran, we recommend that they use a VPN or, or things like that when they come on the helpline, just because we don't want people to you know, accidentally become outed in, in a way that could be dangerous for them if it is um, illegal or socially unacceptable to be non-religious. So how did you navigate that? Uh, did you just not care at this point? Uh, what what was your kind of strategy? I mean, that's the phase you're going through. A lot of people are going through the rebellious phase. So maybe I should have cared more, but... That's the that's the age where you're like making stupid decisions and co very costly decisions. Um, so I mean, I didn't care, but I'm not advocating for that. That was stupid. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, but but <laughs> Helen agrees I, immediately. I, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I did that. Yeah. So I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah not yes. not don't advocate yeah. for it, but I did it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but I did manage to convince a, a couple of my friends. Uh, out of religion even as a teenager so I was very proud of that and I also was like the, these are uh, friends that I considered smart so the fact I, I was kind of like trying to convince them out of religion more for myself because I wanted to see if it makes sense to them so as well because if it was just confirming that I'm not losing my mind by trying to see if they will see what I'm saying um, but yeah so that worked by the way the situation is this might when can I talk about what's happening in Iran? Because this might be a, a, a good segue or not. Like, yes, it, you should, should talk about that question? now. Yeah, go okay, for okay. it. Okay. Because this is the, what I'm describing to you is like 20 years ago, right? What things have changed dramatically in Iran. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we're in the middle, that, that change has been going on for the past 40 years. But right now, things have escalated to the point that I didn't even imagine for us to get here this fast, right? Right now in Iran, like, I mean, we could see even for the past 
10 years that people are leaving religion. We could feel that. We didn't have any data. Now I have data to show that. But for the past 10 years, there seemed to be have a, been a very major shift in attitudes about religion in Iran. And I'm not talking about just about people leaving Islam, but also passionately hating Islam because of the way that their lives have been influenced by it, right? The amount of disgust and hate that exists now in Iran about Islam is, is I think it's unmatched um, in, I don't think, I don't see, I can't find any other country that is that has this level of disgust towards this religion. And we're talking about a country that many people consider Islamic. Um, to the point that based on the data that I, if, I want to show, uh, show to you now, Iran is now a Muslim minority country, a Muslim minority country. And I don't say that. I, I'm not just making that up. I will show you the data, right? Um, I could not imagine that happening in my lifetime. One of the most religious countries in the world is now a Muslim minority country that is being ruled by um, an Islamic government. Um, so, but also before I show you the data, I just want to also mention that this is the trend that we have been seeing in the past a few decades. But right now, what's happening in Iran is a revolution. It's a revolution that has brought all of these views together, all of the, the clash between ideas together. Right? You remember when I said I was a child, I was, a child, I was, I was um, between two worlds, a, a secular world, a liberal world, and a more religious world, right? And these, I note growing up, I always noticed that these viewpoints clashing with each other, right, in, in society. Um, and one of them was way more dominant, is the Islamic narrative, the conservative narrative, the, that, was the, that was the dominant one. Now we're at a point that, so uh, from a societal perspective, the secular liberal one is the dominant one. The only the only place that the Islam Islamic view is now dominant is in the government, but nowhere else, nowhere else, right? And people are now fighting for a secular Iran, and they are paying such heavy prices for it. People are being executed. People are being shot at. People are losing their eyes. Mm -hmm. People are going and protesting in front of bullets. And we this revolution keeps going up and down, like when it comes to how the the, the number of people that are in, like the, the 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 level of protest, but it but it's still happening. It's still happening every day. So the media was covering it for a while at the beginning of it, but now because we are in the civil disobedient phase where people are taking off their hijab in many public spaces, it's not getting covered as much mm -hmm. because it's, it doesn't have those mass protests, but it's still ongoing, right? And um, you could see, if you go right now in Tehran, for example, you, I would not notice it. I will not notice this as, as my childhood in uh, Tehran because uh, even with all the threats and even with all the punishments, you could see um, half of the population is just illegally removing their hijab, right? And um, men are joining this um, protest as well by wearing shorts during summer, which is also illegal, right? So they're trying to do their part as well, right? But mm -hmm. there's a lot of tension going on. The, uh, the government is trying to take a step back because they're noticing that every time somebody, they kill somebody, the protest pick, picks up. So the government is afraid to give the people an excuse to go out and protest again. Um, but now the very religious people, civilians, are now, because they're seeing the government is not taking the action that they want them to take, they're threatening the women themselves, right? So there is a lot of, uh, it's a very, uh, the tensions are very high. And we, we need the people around the world to pay attention to this, especially atheists and secular activists, right? Because Right now in Iran, even though the, most people are not atheists, most people have are not Muslim anymore. And also, even the people who are Muslim are they want secularism. The, the demand for secularism is so high. People have seen what religion does in their government. Um, and this there's two things that are that is happening. There's a secular revolution that involves Muslims as well, 
right? But there's also a mass exodus out of the religion. And I'm what I'm going to claim, this is a country of more than 85 million people, right? And within the past 40 years, around half of this population has, has left religion. Half. So we're talking about the greatest mass exodus of people out of religion in the history of the world, in the history of mankind. We have never had anything like this in less than 40 years. And I will show you the data to back that up. But this is big, and this needs to be noticed by other atheists around the world. We are secular and atheist activists, and we have the greatest mass exodus of people out of religion in history, and most atheists around the world are not even noticing that. That is an we, excellent we, point. Uh, I am really glad you brought that up. Like, we we need to be aware of this, and we're not. I feel like there's a sort of like a stereotype that people have of, oh, you know, everyone there is religious. No, they're not. Show us your charts. I am excited yeah. to learn this. <laughs> I, I also want to point out that too, that we've had, um, we've had agents take phone calls from people in Muslim mm -hmm. countries that are looking for resources to get out. Um, yeah. We don't always ha have that ability to get them out, but we do get people that are talking about how their lives are threatened. And that's why we are so protective of people in those countries that contact mm -hmm. us because we don't want any harm coming to them. So um, the fact that there's people on the front lines in the country, they're just like, fuck it, I'm done, you yeah. know, and putting their lives and safety on the line to have some sense of freedom, some sense of liberation is um, very, very inspiring and something we should definitely take a lesson of in this country. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, you know, it's good to get inspired and support people across the seas that are doing the things that you're afraid to do. Just saying. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this is this is really important work. And I mean, yeah, Helen's right. People that are in this situation are risking a lot more uh, than people in other places where, you know, it's it's not to say that it's easy to be an atheist in in the United States, but it's probably a little bit different situation. So yeah, I want to acknowledge that. Okay, I'm excited to see your report. I love charts and graphs. Of course I do. Uh, show us, tell us, what do we have here? Okay, so before I uh, show you the graphs, the study, this is the study Iranians um, attitudes towards religion a 2020 survey report. And the study is done by Geman. Um, this is the these are the prof, uh, the people behind it so assistant professor this guy and this guy if you want to pause uh, oh should i read their names um i just want to make sure people know that this is not just like an online poll um or just like a facebook poll or stuff like that these are academics behind this and this is based on done by a uh, non-profit so it's an independent non-profit research foundation in netherlands so um just i know i need to make sure that i read out the things that i'm showing but the the main point that I would just wanted to make though is that this is an academic study. It's not just like a something. Uh, yes. It's not yeah, a blog or something. You. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. Excellent point. All this right. is scientific research. <laughs> yeah. So let's go to. I mean, I want to show you this one, but before I get to figure one, um, this is the graph that I show people to show that Iran is now a Muslim minority country, right? So the, the question was, which one of the following is closer to belief and faith, right? So if you, the Shia, so Iran is supposed to be a Shia country. You can see the people who an answered Shia Muslim is 32%. But if you add that to Sunni Muslims, which is uh, 5%, and maybe Sufis, which is 3%, um, is there anything else that would be no so yeah that's about it so that would add up to like 40 percent right is there anything did we miss any other muslims here do we have humanists we have sufis mystical between sufis yeah no Baha maybe baha'is half a percent okay yeah baha'i some people will consider baha'i to be islam as well so yeah 40 percent that would make iran a muslim minority country right so Here's a to see. So 22% answered none. So none of the religions. So you see Zoroastrian, which Helen asked about, 
was answered 7.7%, spiritual 7%, agnostic almost 6%, right? But none answered uh, 22%, atheists answered almost 9%, agnostic 6%. But here's the thing, this, this eight, I, the number of the percentage of atheists, this is my, what I argue. You guys could tell me if I'm right, right or wrong. Uh, based on the graph that I will show above, figure one, that is, I think the percentage of atheists in, in Iran is even bigger than 9%. These are people who call themselves atheists because the question was, which of the following is closer to your belief and faith, right? But if we define atheism as a lack of belief in God, I think there are more people who are atheists that maybe are not choosing the label atheist. Because if you go to the graph above it, right? The, this figure is um, showing the percentages of people who are answering the question, which of the following do you believe in, right? And if you look at the question, God, you get 78%, right? So that would leave you, that would leave you a 22% of people who did not answer that they believe in God, right? So I would say that would be closer to 20% uh, atheists. And I think if you go back to this graph, it actually matches that because I think a lot of people who call themselves spiritual, they don't believe in God. A lot of people, agnostics will also be people who don't believe in God. A lot of these people who are in none will be considered themselves don't believe in God. So basically something between 9% and 22% of people in Iran don't believe in God, which is very high, I would say, if if it's the twenty percent that I'm saying is um, if it's basically close to some of the most advanced countries in the world, right? So we're talking mm -hmm. about the Middle Eastern country that has a percentage of atheists that is closer to first world countries, right? Which is and, and even ahead of a lot of first world countries, which is very unique for uh, the Middle East. But even the people who do still believe in God, they don't believe in Islam. So, and they don't believe in any other religion. So they might believe in God, but they have left Islam and not picked another religion. They have left Islam and stayed without religion, right? So if you look at the people who believe in life after death, which is a requirement to be a Muslim, you only have 37%. 30, only 37% 37 of the people in Iran believe in life after death. That is unbelievably low. Okay, heaven and hell, which I don't know exactly the difference between heaven and hell and life after death, but there's a little bit lower, 30%. Religion, 27% or 28%. Jinn, which means demons, basically. 26% only believe in demons. Uh, in the coming of mankind's savior, which means the Mehdi, which is another requirement for you to be a Shia Muslim. It's only 25%, 26%. Um, oh, and also here, uh, I don't believe in any of these. So here, here, look at this question. Around 20% of people answered, I don't believe in any of these. So here, 20% of the people answered, even though only 9% said that they're atheists, 20% of the people who answered the poll, the survey, said that they don't believe in God. So 20%, I would say that's more representative of the number of atheists in Iran. In Iran. But here's an interesting graph. Figure three says, how have your religious, religious belief changed during your lifetime, right? So this red one, and again, the translation, I've seen the Persian version of this, which is the actual question that went to people, right? The, when it says religious, okay, so here, so 46%, 47% said, I went from being religious to non-religious, okay? I just want to mention that the Persian version of non-religious is actually without religion, from having religion to not having religion, right? So 47% of the people of Iran within one lifetime, like these are shifts that we see through multiple generations. When changes like this happens in history, we haven't seen this, this percentage in one lifetime. It takes Hundreds of years for ch changes like this to usually happen. But within one generation, we see almost half the population of the country going from having religion, from being religious to not being non-religious. That is huge. That is unbelievable. I was optimistic. I was one of the most optimistic people in the world, and I did not predict anything this optimistic. I could not believe this, right? And also, by the way, this percentage, if you look at it for younger people, 
you can see it's even higher. So if you go from 20 to 29 year old, it's actually above 50%. So this means that this trend is keep is going to keep growing as we as younger people as people uh, as we go by, right? So yeah, you can see from about for 50, I mean, 50, uh, people about 50 year olds don't usually change their mind that much, but you can see 40 year old, 40% 40 of them have already, uh, people of even old people have said that they have left religion. It's usually the younger people that say that. So I could go to, there's a lot of graphs here. So I just, I don't want to spend a lot of time uh, going every single one of them. Um, but here's something. Here's a few things that you guys might enjoy. It says, figure nine says, I don't want my child to learn about diverse uh, religious beliefs in school, right? So, I no, I want my, sorry, I want my child to learn about diverse religious beliefs in school. So the majority of people agree more than 50%, but the second question is, is interesting. So diverse, learning about multiple religious views, they said, yes, we have my majority, around half the people said yes. Uh, but the second question, I want my child to be educated in religious teachings and duties in school. 56% disagree. So diverse views, they're all good for, they're okay with that majority, but being basically brainwashed, I think the second question, but in Islam, I think that would be a disagree. But there was another one here. Oh, here's an interesting thing. So I'm going to do the second part of this graph, okay? Because we, this is expected. And then I'm going to do the first one. So there were people in Iran were asked, the hijab should be mandatory in public. Agree or disagree? 72% of Iranians disagreed about hijab being mandatory, okay? That is pretty expected, okay? Obviously, like even Muslims who are pro-hijab, they're a lot of them disagree with the government that it should be mandatory, okay? So I wasn't shocked by that, 72%. I would have guessed. In fact, I would like, I was shocked that it wasn't even higher, to be honest, right? The first, but the, the question above it, that is weird, okay? So I believe in hijab at all. I believe in the practice of wearing the hijab. The majority said they don't even believe in hijab. And here's the thing, we are seeing, we have movements in Iran that they're anti-hijab. So I wanna see in future polls, um, when they say they're not, they're against the hijab, they're not saying that they don't want it for themselves. They just see the entire practice as backwards. And so the idea is that this is modesty culture. So you might think that this is too much, but basically what, what I'm saying is that in Iran, we're not having, many people are not saying that I'm against mandatory hijab. If uh, you, if you want the hijab, you wear the hijab, but let me not wear the hijab. No, we have gone the next step. They're saying that to you that you are backwards for wearing the hijab. Like this is, you should consider removing your hijab, that this is bad for everybody, not just for me. They think, by the way, you might think that this is backwards because you're saying like, okay, this is like very intolerant, right? The idea is, this is modesty culture. This is the idea of um, spreading, they're against spreading the idea that women covering up is a good, is a virtue. So they're saying the demand is not only don't force me to wear the hijab, stop promoting this nonsense. This is not good for our, this is not good for women for this idea to be sold as a virtue, right? So the majority of the people in Iran are against it are against the concept of hijab entirely, not just mandatory hijab. That was interesting. There's so many more interesting things here that I could go through, like alcohol consumption, how many times they pray or if they pray at all. But I, I think I spent enough time um, talking yeah. about this. Yeah, yeah this so is so go. interesting. Um, would you be able to share a link with us? So if people want to oh, yeah. go and review it, they can look over it on their own. Sounds good. Let me just make sure I put the link into in the into the PDF in the comment section. I'll just post it here. Yeah, there we go. That would That's be the great. Link Thank you. Perfect. Yes. And I'll add that to our notes for the show so it can go on there as well. That is great information. And I've been kind of Googling it on the side here too. And it I've noticed it has gotten a lot of attention among, you know, researchers and academic circles. And, you know, to your point that you mentioned earlier, um, you know, it 
hasn't gotten a lot of press. Um, I guess, you know, in general, I hadn't heard about the study. Uh, I think probably a lot of people here haven't either, uh, judging by the, the chat results. And this is fascinating information. I know I remember when I was in school, I took a political science class with a professor who was from Iran, uh, and he would tell us about, hey, listen, I know what y'all are seeing as the image of Iran today is this, you know, very repressive religious uh, community, but I remember growing up there and it was nothing like this. This doesn't describe most people's beliefs. And uh, he was saying this a couple of decades ago, it sounds like that has really started to to boil to the surface uh, or or become uh, more apparent yeah. and wow uh, good on them uh, and I'm, I'm definitely going to look more into this study as well and kind of look into some of their methods and I was just reading briefly on it uh, and I haven't gotten much into it yet but it was saying that uh, they were using uh, methods in particular that are for trying to get at people's real attitudes, which they may be afraid to disclose publicly if there's some risk or, or threat uh, for saying that yeah. out loud. So that makes sense that this would be different than what people might be willing to, to talk about in normal conversation. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I do want to make sure I do want to make sure that we don't um, that there is the among the religious people there right so most religious people there also want secularism but mm -hmm. there are among the religious people there there are uh, radical ones that are willing that that they're thinking that they're losing their islamic government that their islamic way of life and they are willing to pay a heavy price not to let that happen yeah. which is including violence and even dying for it right um so that as much as this exists, I just want to make sure that we do also acknowledge that that also exists. And the government is also still murdering people. Like just last month, they just killed, executed two people for burning the Quran, right? And insulting the prophet, right? And I just want to remind you when these two men who were hanged to death, just to let you know, the way Iran hangs people is not what you see in the movies, where, you know, in the, in the, Wild Wild West, when you saw people being hanged, there's a trapdoor, I think, under them that they open and you get dropped and your neck breaks and you die right away. Mm -hmm. That's not how Iran executes these people. The way it's done in Iran is that they put the noose around your neck um, and they lift you. Armin, Armin, for just for oh. one second, um, if this is disturbing to anybody, um, if you oh, need sorry. to step away, I'm just going to put a trigger warning that if this is bo bothers Thank anybody, you. Um, you know, please step away if you need to do self care or whatever, because I know like, you know, stuff that we're talking about can be kind of heavy and I don't want anyone to be under distress or anything. So if you need Sorry to do some that. self care, no, it's okay. I'm just putting, you didn't, no. you know, I just want to put a trigger warning. No, I should have, I should have, I should have thought about that. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Thank you so no. much, Helen. I should have yeah. thought about that, but yeah. So, so is it okay to say that now? Is yes. It, yeah, it's go okay. ahead. I okay. just I yes. just want to put that trigger warning yeah. in. If people need to step away yes. for a little bit or do self care, that's fine. So <laughs> yeah, I am. Um, yeah, sorry, sorry to go here. I know it's dark and um, it's depressing. It's just the cost that people are paying for fighting for their rights, um, and so I will continue. It's just it's a slow death. It's a slow death. You you are left there and you suffocate and the pressure on your neck and your face is so high that there are reports of people chewing their tongue out while being left hanged there. And there are reports of doctors before they bring you down, they have to constantly come check in if you're still dead yet. And there are sometimes the doctors reports that they came in like 20 minutes and 30 minutes after and they, the person was still not dead. So it's a very, very, I don't even understand why they do that. This is not even prescribed in Islam. But it's the most disgusting way of killing people. I don't know why they go out of their way to make the, I mean, actually, I do know because they're trying to instill fear in people so that they don't do this, right? So the way that the government is trying to treat this right now is trying, is trying to reduce the pressure and increase the pressure at the same time, right? So it knows that if, it cons if, it, if it's too strict with these Islamic laws, their, their revolution will pick up again and there will be mass protests in the streets and it cannot tolerate that, right? But it also knows it's kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place that if it doesn't do anything, the, the uber-religious people 
they will co go against the government. But there, there are certain religious people there that are willing to fight their government. If they think that the Islamic, the Islamic government that they that they bled for, that they fought for, that they had an Islamic revolution for, they believe that this, that the Iranian government is supposed to be the government that keeps Iran for the coming of Mahdi, that gives the that raises an army for the Mahdi to come. And if we don't keep this country Islamic, this we are failing the Mahdi. Okay. And they think this is what's happening. They think that uh, the Iranian government is very strong and the Zionists and the imperialist West has failed to bring it down. And now because they failed to do this with military, with sanctions and military, now they're going to, to the foundations of society and they're trying to destroy the family unit. They say that they, they think the bricks of the society comes from the foundation of what keeps the society together. It's this foundation. And that's why the, the reason, if you take away the hijab, if they weigh the, take away the Islamic way of life, um, the whole family unit will fall apart. And this is what the Zionists and the imperialist West have figured out. The only country that has been strong enough to stand up to the liberal to the liberal order is Iran. Every other country has fallen and they have failed everything else. And this is why they're coming in. And that's why they call these protesters and they, 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 they say that they are agents the, of the enemy of Zionists and, and the Westerners. And and that's what they accuse them of. And they think now their, their own government is falling. Their government is not enforcing Islamic laws. And so they're trying to pressure the government to, I remember they having hashtags to execute, hashtag execute, hashtag no mercy. And uh, they're coming out with signs. Why yeah. are there no more? Why are there no more execution? Why are there? So the government, when the government is executing people is to satisfy these groups of people, which they are also afraid of. So they don't know whether they're afraid of the secular uh, people who are showing up in the streets and doing the protests, or they're more afraid of the radical Muslims who want to keep the country Islamic. So that they, they're, they're trying to navigate appealing to both of these groups of people. So so, so how are they reacting to um, the state, like, you know, taking on Western, like we talked about this when you were on LATV, about how, you know, um, people in government are, you know, putting money and investments into Western, you know, media and sports and things like that, where they're trying to um, become more a part of, you know, the wider world, you know, uh, in a secular way you know, through entertainment and things like that. So, you know, so it's a, you know, um, beneficial relationship between, you know, both worlds and still have these religious extremists that think that if you don't want to wear your, your hijab, that you will be killed. Like, how do you, how does, how are the average citizen in Iran like squaring that? Um, so, so the, they don't, they don't say that you should be killed for not wearing your hijab, right? So, well, or uh, or, or that uh, extreme, yeah. you know, po uh, protesting against the government, you know, not wanting yes. to be under sh a Sharia law, that sort of thing. <laughs> so, so if I understand your question, you're saying how does this fit with uh, you saying you notice they're investing in media so that they like can get yeah, like the Western, the Western value, Western value, Western mm -hmm. values, you know, investing in sports and Western and you know, infiltrating, doing those investments, you know, to um, ex you know, ex have some you know foothold within Western culture, but at the same time mm -hmm. also wanting to reject the West. Um, which specific investment you're talking about? Are you talking about the private sector in Iran making that yeah, investment? Yeah, the private sector. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because okay. there has so, to be some sort of, uh, but there, but there's also government officials that meet with Westerners all the time, and also, yeah. and you know, there are also, you know, there's private sectors that are are investing in Western, um, yes, interests. So it's it it gets fuzzy and weird. <laughs> You know, when yeah, we're so the private talking about uh, when we're talking about like you know the United States versus like Iran and these issues that are coming up. Yeah, so it's it's very complicated. First of all, the private mm -hmm. sector is what it what it does is completely in opposite. Uh, um, their their ideal, their views is completely one eighty different from the government, and they're trying to. Um, they, they also their profit mo their they have a profit motive and they know people are liberal. So they want to make movies and shows that are more liberal, but they're also trying to not cross the government's red lines. Right. So that's the private sector. Um, 
But the government itself has many different institutions and many different people in it, and they have competing interests. And what they say something in public is different mm -hmm. from what they do. And they're also backstabbing each other. So it's not like the Iranian government. It's not as simple as just okay. like say what they're doing. There's like, there's a lot of games that are being played behind the scenes, right? So it's 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 a little bit complicated. But just to just to give you an example of weird things that we were surprised to see was when the revolution was picking up and people didn't know what is about to happen. The private sector, the the people who were making movies and TV series, they started shooting their movies in two versions because they were like, this might actually, this revolution might actually get somewhere. So they were recording their movies with, with hijab and without hijab, just in case the revolution is successful and they could release their movies with the female actresses without hijab. So that's how optimistic the private sector was at that one point when it comes to how the revolution was going. So, so, and a lot of religious people were so offended about this. So it was crazy. Anyways, yeah. That's so okay. interesting. And I, it's fascinating to me too, when you look at how these values are sort of portrayed in the media, it's, it's both reflecting values that are, are currently popular, it's also uh, sort of presenting to people what mm -hmm. is perceived as normal or typical, which can influence uh, ideas. But that that's interesting to me that, you know, again, the bottom line there is going to be, well, the bottom line, <laughs> what's going to make money, what's going to sell, <laughs> it sounds like, yeah. is is the point. Well, OK, this also, has also one, oh, one, 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 one more thing. I also, because I am somebody that does secular activism in, in on English, English channel and also secular activism on the Persian channel. So I think I'm in a unique position to notice how similar right-leaning religious people sound, okay? So I don't know. If, <laughs> so the arguments that they have and the priorities they have and save the children, I don't know, family units, um, they're trying to destroy the society. You have no idea. I, I don't know. Like sometimes when I'm like switching between my English activism and my Persian activism, I'm like, do you guys like share notes or something? Like what is happening? <laughs> it's so weird. It's so strange how similar they sound. So yeah. Yeah, the politics of fear. Yes, yeah. and it's funny you mentioned that at the same time in the chat right now, so many people have been pointing that out too. They're like, wow, this is the exact same arguments <laughs> yeah. that we're hearing here with the religious right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm absolutely. sorry, I, like even as a mom, I'm like, fuck your children. <laughs> because like they have to live in the world. And if you see a drag queen, if your kid sees a drag queen, it's not the end of the world. So just calm your, sh calm your shit calm down <laughs> you're gonna be okay yes. you're gonna be okay it's not so, gonna so i don't i so hate that i hate that um save the children crap it because it, it's just yeah. uh, it's just an excuse to repress people for me and themselves and and it drives me crazy anyway sorry that was a so, side rant <laughs> no 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 i want to i want to touch on that because he there you might say like oh my god my child is saying a drag queen uh, in Iran, they say like oh my god i can't let my daughter out because she's gonna see women without her job i think that's okay so I'm going to have to lock yeah. her up at home because she's, there's so many women without her job. And this is like degeneracy, degeneracy spreading across the land, <laughs> land of God. How could this happen uh, on this holy land? We bled for this and they scream we, like they cry. I watched video. I watched the videos of these religious people. Mm -hmm. They are crying about this. They shout they're like we give martyrs. We give martyrs for Islam. And look what's happening. Like, guys, like you're you're pissing on the blood of our martyrs. Like, how could you let this happen? Like, it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> yes and you know oh, okay. perhaps they could have chosen something different mm -hmm. uh to give their life or to. maybe they need to stop being butthurt and being like you know the world is changing and maybe i maybe yeah. i'm the asshole <laughs> no that's never it that's never <laughs> it. I, oh they're not i'm sorry they're not the asshole i'm sorry i forgot <laughs> no yeah this is this is so fascinating to hear yeah. this it is it is the same so kind much of parallel isn't it? Yeah, mm -hmm. it is. And, you know, we have a ton of questions as well. We have already reached an hour that I could continue talking about this for a whole Armin, you're going to have to come back and um, do another talk. But yeah, mm -hmm. we're going to have to have you back again because this is incredible. Um, I, I am so glad you came. I have 
reading to do now. Um, also, we haven't even talked about your book, uh, which I want to give you a chance to mention and give people links. You have a book too uh, that we should yeah, talk pimp, about. Pimp your book. Um, pimp it. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't do a good job at marketing this because we're giving away the PDF version for free for people who subscribe to our newsletter. <laughs> so, but it's a bestseller on Amazon. I don't know why it's like reverse here on your camera. So I don't know what to no, do. No, no, it's, it's, oh, it's there. okay. I, we can oh, read it. It's okay. Yeah, okay, we can so read it. It says, it's a book, Why There Is No God. It was a bestseller on Amazon. It's very, sh it's very small and short and to the point. It's a good read for people who might want to just be introduced to the very basics of um, arguments, um, responses to arguments for the existence of God, right? It's it's written in a way that it's easy to understand for people that might not have that much experience in debating or philosophical arguments. Because when I wrote this book, I wrote, I read a lot of atheist books and, and, and I felt like it's a little bit not accessible to people with no background about these arguments, right? So I just wanted to write something that was an easy start for somebody who was just trying to get familiar with how to have these discussions. So that's that's my plug, why there's no gun. Yes, and we'll drop a link to the Amazon for that as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I I bought it. It's uh, it's available on Kindle or you know on Amazon. Uh, so I think it's great. And yeah, it is as you oh. said. It really breaks things down. Uh, just kind of simple step by step. It had cites its sources. <laughs> That's important. <laughs> so oh, yeah. I noticed people in the chat saying that they read it. So somebody says, I've read it very well done. Oh, thank you. And Steve yeah. is saying, first audiobook I purchased. Oh, that makes me so happy. I don't know. That's, That's amazing. amazing. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, we have, I have to say, I like to brag on, on our RFR audience here we have a lot of readers in our audience uh, audiobooks we uh, have digital smart people. books yeah we we do a lot of reading here <laughs> so we love resources and i mean i don't read but i watch youtube videos and read articles that. so i do read just not books well armin <laughs> you also are on the youtube yes <laughs> if you yes, have an audio book um, though i'll yeah. listen to your audio book yeah. <laughs> okay <laughs> Yes. Where can people find also, you? <laughs> yeah, um, the Atheist Republic YouTube channel. So we have we cover what's happening regarding religion across the world once a week. Me and Susanna, we um, you know from different countries, um, and we give our opinions about what's what's happening. So sometimes talking about Iran, India, Bangladesh, Egypt, United States, Canada, Nigeria, South Africa. Uganda, something like that. Um, and our, the people in the chat are also from all around the world. So if you're interested in like talking to people like from different countries, that's a great place to hang with. More community Susanna. people, uh, more community. <laughs> yeah. Also, I don't, uh, you guys know Secular Rarity, right? Uh, Elliot? Yes, here? we yeah, do. So. We've had yes, him we, on right. as well. He's one of my good friends. So yes, yeah. yes, we do. So <laughs> Me and Elliot, once on Atheist Republic's YouTube channel, once a week we take one of these Islamic videos uh, from you know popular Muslim channels, the most popular U U Muslim YouTube channels like Muhammad Hijab, Ali Dava, Smile to Jannah, Daniel Hayraju. These are like the people from the the, the Muslims people who are um, active in the Muslim scene on YouTube. These are the main names they know, right? So we take some of their videos and we just dissect it and look at their claims and it's just it's hilarious we have such a good me and Elliot have such a good time responding to muslim claims oh also now that um andrew tate also who's a muslim now uh whenever he defends islam me and uh, Elliot, we take the opportunity to uh, review what he's been saying as well or any, or if he says anything about lgbt next week by the way andrew tate recently has said something has made some new claims about LGBT, where me and Elliot, we're going to review it together. So if you're interested in that, check that out because it's very and There fun. is a very nuanced yeah. view of LGBTQ plus people. I cannot <laughs> wait to be Yay. horrified by it. Um, so <laughs> we will be watching your review of that <laughs> for sure. Yeah. And I have dropped that link in the chat and we'll put it in the show notes too. Oh, I actually am gonna look forward to that <laughs> and, um, you guys would be ter 
You guys, you guys, if you see the like me and Elliot when we review the Islamic YouTube scene about their comments on LGBT, I think a lot of you would be terrified. I, I think a lot of you would be like, these are the most wildest, disgusting views you could imagine, and we we have to deal with that. It's it's horrible. It's horrible. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. It really yeah, is. people we're... deal with a lot in the world. Yeah. Uh, there there is a lot out there that is just so harmful and violent and awful to people mm -hmm. and i'm sorry that you and your viewers have to deal with it and that anybody has to deal with it and again i mean thank you so much for everything that you do to try and help people see that that is not the only way to think about things and that they're not losing their minds by questioning whether that is a good way to be in the world so that is you're doing a lot uh, you're doing a lot and we appreciate well, thank you, you. Yeah. Oh, thank you guys. Yeah, I was just thank you. The comments. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, you're it, getting a lot of love in the comments here in the chat, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and we are any, almost any, out of time, but yeah, go ahead. Do you have a another thought? I know any questions that we need to yes. respond to or no? Okay. We yeah. do have some questions. There's no way we're gonna get through all of them because we have a ton, but that's why we have the hangout. So if we don't get to your questions, stick around for the hangout. Uh and we'll talk more. But I wanna try and get at least a couple of questions. Uh maybe Helen and I can at least ask you one each. Um, and there are a ton here. Let's see. Um, I will try and pull one of them. So uh, one thing that I'm interested in, someone else was asking when you were talking about uh, the the charts and the graphs showing the change in people's minds about their religious beliefs over time. Uh, one question that someone asked was, which factors do you attribute to changing the minds of middle age and older folks? Um, as you mentioned, we tend to see that more in younger people changing their mind, but you were pointing out that a lot of older people had changed their minds. Um, what do you think uh, could be some of the reasons for that? Do you have any ideas on on why yeah, that could have happened? I think for in Iran, it's the same reason for most young people. It's because the cost they have paid for living under an Islamic government, right? It's the experience that they have had. It's the, so many lives ruined. So mm -hmm. many people, the devastating cost that Iranian people have paid for the past 40 years because of living under a theocracy. That's wow. the, I, I, one thing that we tell people is that we will never, one thing that we could thank the Islamic Republic of Iran for is that it seems to have been the greatest force for against religion that has that has ever been in ever like no there's no atheist activist that has ever been able to match the level of success that the islamic republic of iran has had in convincing people out of religion wow that is a That's awesome. strong endorsement or not endorsement <laughs> <laughs> incredible um okay uh helen do you want to ask a question okay, i can i can more. i can read words sure yes please do <laughs> <laughs> i like uh, jokes. so let me see here um Actually, um, this was actually this is a pretty good um, question that I didn't think of when you gave us when you, we were talking about your story before. So when you um, with your suicide attempt, did the school change anything in regards to maybe not be having the ability for kids to jump out windows? <laughs> yes, they added they added grills, they added bars <laughs> on the windows. I don't wow. know. Yeah. yeah. They didn't change yeah. the teaching or or anything like that. Just yeah. put bars on the windows. Just to be clear, they, they don't they, I put two and two together. They don't go out and tell you that a, a, a suicide is a good way to go to heaven, right? I put different like nope. <laughs> I, I was weird. like other pe other kids didn't do like there's no other people. This is a very unique thing I did. Like I don't want to. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure I tell. Oh, yeah. like, this is not kids are not going and jumping out windows just to go to heaven. I put um, these are separate things about suicide being a sin that takes you to hell, and also there's no sin before age of marriage. I put these 
before age of reason i put these mm -hmm. together to come up with this conclusion so i don't think they were worried about other kids thinking about this because i was a very, <laughs> i was the only one that has ever come to this conclusion <laughs> and yet i mean it it's not an unreasonable conclusion yeah. based on the information they were giving i, I mean it kind of makes you wonder I, I think somebody mentioned this in the chat too how many other kids may have thought that and just uh, we talked about this through. when arm and i were talking about it when he was on um la tv i thought it too when i was a kid but the thing is though is that the catholic church makes suicide a sin like no matter what so if, like if you commit suicide boom you go to hell so but i right. contemplated it because when i was a kid not because my life was terrible i was just like well why if heaven is so great and i know that i'm you know i had already suffered like minor upsets as a child you know like you you do get a concept that life is going to suck even when you're a kid you know and i was like oh you know what maybe i should just kill myself and i can be with god and it will be it will be awesome but then right around when i was questioning that the church started going into about how suicide is bad and you will immediately go to hell and i was like well god damn it now i can't now i have to suffer through life <laughs> so, yeah yeah Sounds there was a mom there was it. a mom that killed her children so that they don't they ever going to hell to, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so yeah you're not the yeah. only person so, yeah. in the world that ever thought of this yeah yeah, <laughs> wow. yeah, yeah. oh and i'm just she, was, she now, thought she's doing him a favor she was like i'm saving yeah. them from going to hell yeah yeah and I mean, that's a that's the type of things that religious indoctrination does to your brain it makes you believe horrible. It will uh, make you believe in horrible things. So you will commit horrible things. Mm -hmm. um, just yeah. a side note on a positive. We just went over $39,000 um, on the fundraiser money. Ooh, We're yay. at 39,020, I think something like that. So I am Amazing. like, so I just checked. I just wanted to see what we were at. So if you haven't donated yet and you've got an extra $5 in your pocket that you could give to Starbucks, but would like, but could give to us, donations are still mm -hmm. open until Friday. So yeah, <laughs> there are can people, people donate anonymously. Yes, yes, you can donate anonymously. Yes, you. you do not yes. have to um, get your name out there. Um, any donation is appreciated and we love you anonymous or not. We love you and thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, um, Helen, would you like to put the link in the chat? Some people I will, I will put the link. <laughs> thank you. And on that happy note, I think it is about time to start wrapping up so we can go to the hangout. Um, before we wrap up and move on, Armin, do you have any final thoughts that you want to leave us Ooh. with it's no pressure um, just I, I didn't want to cut you off if okay. you had anything else you wanted to mention <laughs> no maybe i mean i didn't prepare anything so maybe i'll just say this um so here's here, here's here's what i want to say you, you most of the people here who are you know listening to us um they're living in places where I know things are bad. I know things are not perfect. I know things could be a lot better. And I know religious people and are making things difficult for almost everyone. Um, but you know, there's no but. I just want you to know you also have certain things that a lot of people before you, a lot of activists before you have spent, have sacrificed a lot, right? And it's important for you for all of us to fight for us to keep those right so things could be better when i say when i want to celebrate how far we become how, how far we, we have come i don't want to dismiss how far we still have to go because some people think that appreciating that progress means that we are dismissing the progress that still needs to be made i'm not dismissing that okay but we do need to look back and see how far we've come and also notice that it has been a lot of hard work a lot of sacrifice um a lot of people that we don't even know their names have given so much for for their rights and the freedoms that you have and for any sense of stability or security that you enjoy today there was somewhere someone somewhere at some point that either gave up their life or their freedom or their sense of security or being or with the people that they love in their life they've given up on that for you to be able to enjoy having that right now and there are many places in the world right now that they are so far behind on this and they are fighting the same fight uh, of people that came before you 
to get you to the place that you are today, right? And I just want to make sure that while we're enjoying the rights and freedoms that we have right now in the places that we are, to while we're grateful for that and we're appreciating that, appreciating that, to also make sure that we shine a light on the on on the on the same path and the same struggle that people are now making in other places and try to notice that they we need to it's our responsibility to 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 help to get to at least get them to the place that we are right now 100% yes thank you so much this was it, what i had hoped for this evening and more you have given us so much to think about and and you have done so much work to shine that light and make resources available to people so thank you again for all of your efforts as well and you're definitely coming back to talk to us again i have yeah, decided yeah helen has decided I, it, it's I, like armin i'm volunteering you you're gonna come yeah. back okay yeah okay yeah this sure. is amazing <laughs> yeah this is this is wonderful uh, i'm thank a you card for that. if i say it i'll make it so so, yes, you know, Helen makes it so that's true. That's true. <laughs> and uh, so thank you. Uh, we'll move to the hangout now. We'll go ahead and wrap up a real quick first and remind mm -hmm. everybody we will be here again next week. Same time, same channel. We have Dr. Ray giving a talk next week on trauma and your brain. So uh, kind of a, a fitting follow up uh, here. So definitely join us for that one next week. And again, if you want to catch up on more RFRX episodes between now and next week or now and whenever you're watching this, um, you can find more episodes on our YouTube channel or wherever you get your podcasts. You can find it either way. I don't know why that's not pasting in the chat. I'll get it in there. Uh, but also don't forget you can email us as well if you have any questions or comments or ideas for future shows that you would like to see, you can email us at rfrx at recoveringfromreligion.org. And don't forget to check out our blog and our podcast, which I'm also dropping in the chat. And while I do that, Helen, would you like to tell people where they can find us on the social medias? Okay, so um, unless you just found your way here through um, os like osmosis or a, a psychic wizard told you, I am assuming that you are familiar with the social medias. So we have a Facebook main page. We have a Facebook support group page. We have a Twitter we have an Instagram and we have a TikTok. So I know all of you are internet savvy for the most part, and you can share, like, heart, subscribe, um, leave a comment, do all the things. So do those things so people have access to our resources because there, I guarantee there's somebody out there that you're not thinking of that will, might need our resources. So always feel free to share, like, um, always um, reach out to people because they might you might think they not need us, but they do. So please consider um, doing all the social stuff. All right. Now we're going to launch the feedback poll. Um, Car's going to do that because they're I'm the smart it. one of us. <laughs> so, sure, we'll go with that. Um, I'm, I'm I'm giving you a compliment. <laughs> Thank you. I am working on receiving compliments. Thank you for that. <laughs> and you are smart and beautiful, and I'm glad you're my friend. <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay, so. Um, this just gives us feedback on um, the talk of the program in general to help us out. So I'm going to read this in the way that I do, which is complete bullshit. So one, this program was relevant to me. One, absolutely not. I don't know why I'm here. Why did I show up? Five, yes. Oh my God. I learned so much. I am so glad this talk happened. Great. And two to four is kind of like a gauge, like a feeling. <laughs> so Number two, the speaker was clear and understandable. One, banana phone, talking to the tin cans, couldn't hear shit. Oh my God, help him. <laughs> Five, yes, clear and understandable, perfect. Like he was standing right next to me. It was fantastic. And two to four, you might need to adjust the volume on your speakers. Just saying. <laughs> Number three, I will definitely attend future programs like this. One, nope, absolutely not. You all suck. I will not be back. Five, yes, I love it here. Everyone is amazing, especially Helen and Kara. And I will return. And two to four, again, feelings, a gauge of how 
how you want to participate, if you'll come back. We have a lot of interesting talks. We're going to talk about trauma in the brain next week. You want to be there for that. You want to be here. So you're going to show up, right? Exactly. <laughs> and how did you find RFRX? So if your psychic wizard didn't tell you, we are found through either the RFX online community or Slack, through a meetup event, through Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, or wherever you get your socials, um, through our Discord, through the Discord, um, through our, our website or other, which I would assume is your psychic wizard. <laughs> so that, so while you guys are finishing that up, I'm going to introduce our wonderful, beautiful, amazing executive director, Gail Jordan, to give a final moment. And I am out. <laughs> Thank you, Helen. Sometimes the highlight of my week is being introduced at this program. <laughs> Those are always such kind words. Um, Armin, I, I, am, I am moved. I'm not very often without words and speechless, but I am so moved by your story. And while, while I know it's been a lifetime since that time in your life, it has to still evoke emotions in you when you tell it over and over again. And, and I so appreciate your candor and your emotional availability and all the things that you have shared with us. Um, I'd like to say also that you are one of those upon whose shoulders we're standing. And I so appreciate the cost and the sacrifices that you've made and the price that you pay for pushing back and for trying as hard as you are to be a secular person in a, in a difficult situation. I, I, it was just a wonderful presentation. And I, I know that you weren't able to track the chat the entire time, but everybody in the room was enthralled and engaged with everything you said. So thank you so much for coming and sharing. Uh, I'm so deeply grateful. Helen, I said sometimes that the highlight of my week is hearing the introduction at this meeting because you all say such nice things, but this week was an exception because on Saturday we had our fundraiser and the folks who believe in us, who share our, our passion and our vision for what we're doing came the hell through and we have we are pushing and I believe one of you announced even just tonight that we have crested the $39,000 point. So we are going to hit 40. We $39,000. And if you 44,000, Matt gets a tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We've got a, we've got several more days left on the fundraiser. Uh, if you can give $4 or $1 or $2 or $20 or a gajillion dollars, we'll, we'll take that as well. Thank you so much. You know, recovering from religion is different than other orgs. We don't have, we don't have membership. So we don't have that income, that revenue stream. We don't have a convention. We don't have that revenue stream. Our services uh, cost nothing for our clients. They're, they, they are able to access the resources, the support groups, the chat line, the online community, all of the resources we offer at zero cost because of our donors and because of the generous spirit of the people who contribute. And, and as I said, share our passion for helping those who need the support and help that that we provide. If if donating is not your thing, or if you're not in a place to do that, and you would rather volunteer for us, that's okay too. We'd love for you to join our volunteer family. Um, the girls always say, or the, the team always says, it is the coolest place to be. It is a wonderful time to be part of Recovering from Religion, not just because the volunteer group is a family, not just because of that, but because we are having, this is a critical mass, as, 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 as Armin so beautifully illustrated, this is a time of critical mass for secularism in our country, in our country, around the world, because people are waking up to the fact that religion, while it served its purpose and had its place, is, is not relevant to how we live our lives now, that it's, it's, uh, um, it is against society and against progress and against science and against development. And, and so we're having more and more people, it's uh, between the internet, between people being willing to ask questions, it's a wonderful time to be part of recovering from religion. And yet there are still folks who come in to our helpline who need our, our kind, non-judgmental listening ear, who need our, our resources that are so carefully curated to provide as much help as possible, who need our online community to be able to share stories with folks who are going through a similar journey, who need our fall excursion as a weekend recovery 
getaway, to be able to get away from screens and to be immersed in other folks who are willing to share their story and willing to talk about what they have been through, even if it rises to the level of trauma like it has for so many. Armin, thank you again for visiting with us. I look forward to the next time that you come. It was just a, it was a, such a powerful talk. And thank you everyone uh -huh. else for attending. Thank you for our behind the scenes folks, all of our guys that work together to make this happen. We are all deeply grateful. Have a wonderful hangout and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.